Hello and welcome to this, the seventh in the Inquirers series, this time on fasting and preparation for communion. In the first part of the session, I will speak specifically about preparing for receiving communion. As you learned last week, we are approaching the Lord in the Eucharist, so our preparation is essential. I will refer to the canons of the Church. These are rules and regulations laid down by the Apostles and the Fathers of the Church to ensure proper order, as we have mentioned before. It is easy to get hung up on these in a very pharisaical way, so it is best to be guided by our spiritual fathers and mothers in these matters. Everything I will say in the following hour is for information only. Please always discuss your prayer and fasting rules with your spiritual parent, just as you would discuss an exercise regime with your doctor or a physical trainer. In the second part, we will cover fasts and fasting generally, and look particularly at St. John Chrysostom's words on the subject. We're expected to fast. Jesus said, as reported in Matthew 6, 16 to 18, when you fast, and follows with directions that it should be in secret and that we should behave normally and not make a mournful show of it like the hypocrites. Now, as usual, we have a great deal of ground to cover, so we'd best get started. First, we need to remember that nothing we can do will fit us for communion. We are, have always been, and will remain unfit to receive communion. It is a gift from God who makes us worthy to receive and uses it as a remission of sins for health of our bodies and souls and for our eternal life. Always know when you're next going to receive Holy Communion. Preferably write it in your diary and then everything you will do will be a preparation for receiving. You are then anticipating receiving Holy Communion with excitement. Each day as it draws nearer, you count down the days and try each day harder and harder not to sin. Properly speaking, all Christians should order their lives from communion to communion. Your life is led always focusing upon receiving communion, keeping communion always in your mind and your heart. These are the links of the chain that guide us from communion to communion. We should participate in the church's liturgical worship. Practice a rule of personal prayer. Practice a rule of ceaseless mental prayer or prayer of the heart to ensure our constant remembrance of God. Practice periods of silence. Practice fasting and abstinence. Read the Bible and spiritual writings. Confess our sins and thoughts, feelings, temptations and dreams to our pastor or to someone whom our pastor authorises and blesses for this purpose. There are a few more links. Give and receive forgiveness of sins with all the people in our lives. Make donations of money to the church and to those in need. Share our time, energies and possessions with others. And make constant effort to do our daily work as well as we can to God's glory for the good of people. And there's more. Continually strive not to sin in the smallest way in the routine activities of our everyday life and personal relationships. And finally, remember that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, so they must be properly cared for, but not pampered. It is important to remember that we must be constant, 
consistent, attentive and disciplined. A day without prayer is a day wasted. How exactly each person does this will be dependent on the individual's life. A priest will prepare differently from a lay person and a monastic differently from either. This needs to be discussed with a spiritual father. The night before you are going to receive communion. Try to get to Vespers if it is being served. In church or in your icon corner at home, say the pre-communion prayers are set out in the prayer book. There are also pre-communion prayers available online and the link is in the bibliography of this presentation and also in the description of the video. Say them slowly and meaningfully, paying attention to the gift Christ is about to bestow on you. Here is an excerpt of Archimandrite Philip from the Monastery of St. Anthony and St. Cuthbert speaking about the prayers of preparation for communion. This one is the last of the nine prayers in the service of preparation for Holy Communion. St. John of Damascus remembers the one who wrote this, and he is not writing it for you to read, or for me to read, or for anybody else to read. He wrote it for himself. So it comes from the depth of his own understanding of his relationship with God. And it's worthwhile thinking that whenever you read any of the saints' prayers, they're, they're not writing as an exemplar for you to read. They're, they're, they're writing it because this is how they prayed. And so we call him a saint. But listen to what he says about himself. And then you can decide whether you're like him. So St. John of Damascus is standing before the iconostasis in church. And this is what he says. I stand before the doors of thy temple, and yet I refrain not from my terrible thoughts. But do thou, O Christ God, who didst justify the publican, and hast mercy on the Canaanite woman, and is open the gates of paradise to the thief. Okay, so he's saying already, I'm a baddie, and I know that I can't receive communion really. But on the other hand, you did this for these three, and he carries on to himself. Open unto me the compassion of thy love toward mankind. You know, don't forget that God is always full of love and compassion. God loves you. He is, he literally died to give you communion. He's dying to give you communion. He died to give you himself. Open unto me the compassion of thy love toward mankind, and receive me as I approach, and touch thee, like the harlot and the woman with the issue of blood. For the one, by embracing thine immaculate feet, receive the forgiveness of her sins. And the other, but by touching the hem of thy garment, received healing. And then he says something really spectacular. He says, and I, most sinful, remember this is John of Damascus talking to God, and I, most sinful, dare to partake of thy whole body. Shocking shocking prayer these other two they they stretched out their finger or they touched the foot let me not be consumed but receive me as thou didst receive them and enlighten the senses of my soul consuming okay let not me be consumed but consuming the accusations of my sins through the intercessions of her that, without seed gave thee birth, and of the heavenly powers, for thou blessed unto ages of ages. Amen. I can hardly read that when I read it, without wanting to weep, but not out of self-pity, not out of sin, out of sin or shame, but out of the joy of the love of God. 
Okay, that's why it is that we say these prayers. You read the other ones. This is number nine. Or, or read the canon of preparation for communion. And don't go around there with your head hanging low and say, Ooh, I am so awful. You are. But notice, notice God. I mean, that's the idea. Notice God. Forget about you. Doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Notice God. You know, turn to another one, any old one, and put my fingers somewhere or other. For thou, O Master, didst say, Whoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me and I in him. True in all thy words, ways is the word of my Lord and God. For he who partaketh of the divine and deifying gifts is in no way alone, but is with thee, O my Christ, thy triradiant Son, who illumineth the world. <laughs> And that was literally accidental. I had no idea. But what a wonderful, beautiful way of coming before God. That's why we prepare. So when we do stand like St. John of Damascus before the gates and say, Oh, I must not receive any harm the Look, the And I'm still having terrible thoughts. I can't get these ghastly thoughts out of my mind. Say, so actually, that's how John felt at Damascus. That's how St. John Chrysostom felt when he approached communion. But they stood forward. They took that step. And the audacity of it, like in Mark 2, 26, King David, the audacity of taking the showbread, it cost somebody else his life. The audacity of it. We need that same audacity. The audacity of not stepping forward for the showbread, but stepping forward to receive the body and blood of Christ. See how audacious it is. This is what we say all the time when we are going to approach for communion. And don't just let it be blah, 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 blah. It is much better to say one or even one sentence or just that sentence. Take any old sentence. Um, take, uh, let's have any old one. Let's have this one here. Um, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am not worthy to lift up my eyes to the height of thy glory, for I have affronted thy goodness, and transgressed thy commandments, and disobeyed thine ordinances. But thou, O Lord, who rememberes not evil, but art long suffering of great mercy, who has not given me over to perish in my lawlessness, but has ever await my return. Enough. Okay? That's the spirit with which you need to prepare for communion. <laughs> okay? God is sitting on his high tower, staring into the distance, looking for... I can see dust. It must be my son or my daughter coming back home. <gasps> I must start running towards him or her. Wow. That's absolutely amazing, isn't it? One hardly knows what to say following that. However, we'll carry on with what one needs to do the night before communion, apart from saying one's pre-communion prayers. You should also eat and drink nothing from midnight, unless for medical reasons you must, but see your spiritual father about this. And you must also abstain from sexual relations. On the morning of communion, continue to eat and drink nothing at all, unless for proper medical reasons you need to. For example, if you have diabetes, you must. And if you have pills, you need to take with a bit of food. But you must discuss this with your spiritual father or mother. Arrive in church in good time. You should be there for the opening blessing, but in certain circumstances you may receive if you arrive no later than the gospel. If you have small children in tow, you may arrive later, but again, speak with your spiritual father about this. Make sure you say the preparatory prayers immediately before communion. It begins, I believe, Lord, and I confess, and is part of the liturgy, and will be said generally by everybody. After receiving Holy Communion, 
receive the antitherin and wine, if that is to be your custom, and return to your place. After communion, one should remain in the temple and hear and partake in the post-communion prayers, as I mentioned last week. Don't leave until after the priest gives the blessing at the end. If you have a job after the liturgy outside the temple, serving tea, for example, you should make sure that you say the post-communion prayers at home or later privately in the temple. Then, after your day is over and you have received Holy Communion, write in your diary the date when you're next receiving Holy Communion so that you can start preparing for that with the same anticipation as you did for this one. When fasting is mentioned, it often produces a groan. But we fast because we long for God. It is because we look forward with jubilant anticipation to, for example, the Feast of Pascha and its joy, that we fast in preparation for it. It can sound very dry, but actually it is a reset in our lives that is both refreshing and renewing. Fasting is a spiritual discipline. It enhances our participation in the Eucharist. Fasting is not restricted only to food. It is more than simply not eating or not eating certain things. It is also not lying, stealing, cheating, committing adultery, gossiping, quarrelling. We must abstain from all forms of evil. To think that by only setting a few days aside to omit certain foods from our diet makes us worthy to receive the Eucharist is to be spiritually naive. The general practice of Wednesday and Friday fasting is unrelated to participation in the Eucharist. Canon 69 of the Holy Apostles says, if any bishop, presbyter or deacon or reader or singer does not fast the fourth day, Wednesday, or the day of preparation, Friday, let him be deposed, unless he be hindered by some bodily infirmity. If he be a layman, let him be excommunicated. Although today this canon would not be exercised necessarily to its full extent, it does mean that regular fasting must be a way of life. Orthodox Christians fast on Wednesday in remembrance of the betrayal of Christ and on Fridays in remembrance of his crucifixion and death. Many Orthodox Christians extend the Wednesday and Friday fast to Saturday. It seems to them that if they fast on Wednesday and Friday in preparation for the Eucharist on Sunday, it is right to fast on Saturday, the day before receiving communion. However, in so doing, they are disregarding the 64th canon of the Holy Apostles, which explicitly forbids ever fasting on Saturday. The interpretation of the canon says that where a clergyman is found fasting on a Saturday, except on those exceptional Saturdays such as Holy Saturday, let him be deposed. If a layman is fasting on any of these days, let him be excommunicated. We do not fast on a Saturday primarily because it is the day of rest and the one on which God rested from all his works of creation. To claim that one has not fasted on the previous Wednesday and Friday and therefore cannot come forward to communion is by itself an insufficient reason to abstain from the Eucharist as they are unrelated. We fast in accordance with the words of Christ he said, the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them and then they shall fast. That's Matthew 9 verse 15. The Eucharistic fast involves total abstinence from any food or drink in the morning before receiving Eucharist. If therefore you keep the Eucharistic fast 
and there exists no moral reason for you to stay away from the chalice, you become obligated to come forward and receive Christ as he is offered at the liturgy. So strongly did the Church feel about this that we find in the ninth apostolic canon of the Holy Apostle, Apostles rather, the following. All those faithful who enter and listen to the scriptures but do not stay for prayer and holy communion must be excommunicated on the grounds that they are causing the church a breach of order. The people of the early church attended liturgy for one reason, the Eucharist. St John Cassian writes, we must not avoid communion because we deem ourselves to be sinful. We must approach it more often for the healing of the soul, but with much humility and faith, considering ourselves unworthy. Otherwise, it is impossible to receive communion once a year, as certain people do. Such people manifest more pride than humility, for when they receive, they think themselves worthy. Fasting was never intended to be a barrier to keep us from Christ, but a bridge to lead us to fuller participation in the life of Christ. In general, two views emerge concerning confession and the Eucharist. The first sees confession as necessary before each participation in the Eucharist. The second sees confession as a periodic practice, not required before every participation in the Eucharist. Viewing confession as a prerequisite to every participation in the Eucharist can hinder one's spiritual life because confession becomes an excuse not to receive communion. Confession itself is not a hindrance but people can make it an impediment. The Church does not require a confession from her people every time they wish to partake of the Eucharist. It is not uncommon to hear people say that they are not regular participants in the Eucharist because they have not been to confession. As a regular communicant, you should plan on periodic confession this usually means anywhere from once a month to once every six months, as defined by your priest. In the tradition of the Church, it is not acceptable to keep away from the Eucharist using confession as an excuse. The sacrament of confession exists to enhance our approach to the Eucharist, not to impede it. The first Christians received Holy Communion every Sunday. And here I re reiterate the Ninth Apostolic Canon. You will remember it from a few slides ago. This indicates how seriously the Eucharist should be taken. If you feel you are not worthy to receive, this is good. No one is, ever. Christians sin constantly. Sin is part of our life. Therefore, forgiveness must also be a part of our life. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. The Eucharist, approached correctly, takes away our sin and gives us the strength to draw closer to God. What is the correct manner? The answer is found in the liturgy itself, when the priest presents the chalice and intones, With fear of God and faith and love Then, draw near. If you have fasted and prepared and there is no moral or canonical reason to stop you from receiving.
To live a life of infrequent participation in the Eucharist benefits the devil alone. The longer you stay away from the Eucharist, the stronger the devil's influence in your life. Receive Jesus Christ. His body and blood both deifies and nourishes. It deifies the spirit and nourishes the mind. It heals, purifies, enlightens and sanctifies the body and soul. It helps us to turn away from every fantasy, evil practice and diabolical activity, which work subconsciously in our members. It increases virtue and perfection for communion with the Holy Spirit as a provision of salvation and eternal life. There are certain times when you may not receive communion. If you have committed a serious sin and neither repented nor confessed it, for example, blasphemy, apostasy, failure to receive Holy Communion for a long time, seeing clairvoyance or the like, murder, fornication, adultery, theft, fraud, cruelty. I'm sure you can think of a few other things. A priest has placed you under a ban and he has not lifted it. You have a subturating sore. You need to speak to your spiritual father about that because there may be allowances. You are bleeding. You have killed an animal with a backbone, a vertebrate, that morning. You've broken the pre-communion fast. You've become a member of another church or religion. Now, certainly with breaking the pre-communion fast, as I mentioned before, there are some circumstances where that is allowable, but those are the basic rules. While we're not in general to concern ourselves with what others are doing or not doing, we should see if someone is new that they are comfortable you should ask them if they're orthodox and if not, explain that they, can't they, they can receive the antitheran but not communion and take them to the holy door to do so. If they've not been baptised, they may not receive the antitheran but should still be taken to the priest and introduced kindly. Some orthodox have stricter rules about this. So if you're visiting a church, you may find that you're treated very slightly differently according to how they look at things. There are four main periods of extended fasting. Great Lent, which is six weeks preceding Holy Week in anticipation of the Feast of Feasts, Pascha, followed by the fasting of Holy Week. Great Lent is preceded by the meat fast that starts on the Monday after the Sunday of the Last Judgment through to Cheese Fair Sunday, also known as Forgiveness Sunday. On Forgiveness Sunday, many attend Forgiveness Vespers, where we hear the Lord's teaching about fasting and forgiveness and enter the season of the fast, forgiving one another so that God will forgive us. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. That's Matthew 6, 14. There is also the Nativity Fast, or Advent, also called St. Philip's Fast, coming immediately after his feast on November the 14th. It lasts from November the 15th to December the 24th for 40 days in anticipation of Christmas, the festival of the Nativity of our Saviour. There is also the Apostles' Fast, which begins the Monday after All Saints, which is a variable feast because it depends on when Pascha falls. And it ends on the feast day of Saints Peter and Paul on June the 29th. So it finishes on the 28th in anticipation for the feast. And then there's also the Dormition Fast, 
this is the first two weeks of August in anticipation of the Feast of the Dormition of the Mother of God, the Theotokos. There are also other days on which we fast. On the eve of the Theophany, which is January the 5th, on the beheading of St. John the Baptist, which is August the 29th, on the elevation of the Holy Cross, which is September the 14th, all Wednesdays, as mentioned before, except for fast free weeks in remembrance of the betrayal of Christ by Judas Iscariot, and all Fridays, except for fast free weeks, in remembrance of Christ's crucifixion. In the Antiochian tradition, fast free weeks are the week following the Sunday of the Publican and the Pharisee, cheese fair week, meat and meat products only are not permitted, Paschal bright week, the week after Pascha, the week after Pentecost, and the nativity season from the 25th of December to January the 5th. The 50 days after Pascha, strict fasting is relaxed, but you should consult your father confessor about fasting during this period. And then again, another fast free period is the leave taking of Pascha. Here is Steve, whom you've met before from the Greek Orthodox Church in America to talk about fasting. Last week, we focused on forgiveness. This week, before we focus on what we eat, what goes into our mouths, we really need to focus on what comes out of our mouths. Conversations about fasting always seem to focus on what we can and can't eat, but that's only part of the story. We'll see in the next few weeks how changing what we eat can help change who we are and how we relate to God and to each other. But that kind of growth doesn't just come by changing what we eat for 40 days. We can avoid meat and milk and oil and everything else and still not get the full benefit of fasting. We actually read about this a few weeks ago in the parable of the publican and the Pharisee. A Pharisee, a person who studied the scripture a lot, went to the temple to pray. And he stood up nice and tall and confident and talked about all the good things he was doing, including how much he fasted. And he thanked God that he wasn't like other sinners, especially that tax collector. The publican, or tax collector on the other hand, was so ashamed of his sins that he couldn't even look up. All he could do was humbly ask God to have mercy on him. The Pharisee fasted a lot. He probably fasted more than most of us do. He controlled what he ate, what went into his mouth. But he didn't control what he thought or what he said what came out of his mouth. He insulted and condemned and judged the tax collector. What good is it to fast from food and condemn another person? We've already talked about how our bodies aren't bad. They're an important part of who we are. Similarly, food isn't bad. It's a part of God's creation. And just avoiding food isn't enough to help us to grow in love or holiness. Christ himself taught us this. Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. These are the things which defile a man. Fasting is really important, and we'll talk more next week about how the discipline of fasting can help us. But right from the very beginning, we need to realize that if we're going to get the true benefit of fasting, we can't just focus on what's going into our mouths. We really need to focus on what's coming out. Let the mouth also fast from disgraceful speeches and bad mouthing. For what does it profit if we abstain from birds and fishes, and yet bite and devour our brethren? The evil speaker eats the flesh of his brother, and bites the body of his neighbor. This comes from a series called Be the Bee, B E the B E E, which you can find on YouTube and I commend it to you. There's a lot of very good stuff in short and very digestible form. 
Over the next few slides, I will read to you some excerpts from St. John Chrysostom. He has a lot of important things to say about fasting and says it very well. I speak not, indeed, of such a fast as most persons keep, but of real fasting, not merely an abstinence from meats, but sins too. For the nature of a fast is such that it does not suffice to deliver those who practice it unless it be done according to a suitable law. For the wrestler, it is said, is not crowned unless he strive lawfully. 2 Timothy 2 verse 5 To the end, then, that when we have gone through the labour of fasting, we forfeit not the crown of fasting, we should understand how and after what manner it is necessary to conduct this business. Since that Pharisee also fasted, Luke 18.12, but afterwards went down empty and destitute of the fruit of fasting. The publican fasted not, and yet he was accepted in preference to him who had fasted, in order that you may learn that fasting is unprofitable except all other duties follow with it. The Ninevites fasted and won the favour of God. Jonah 3.10 The Jews fasted too, and profited nothing, nay, they departed with blame. Since then the danger in fasting is so great to those who do not know how they ought to fast, we should learn the laws of this exercise, in order that we may not run uncertainly, nor beat the air, nor, while we are fighting, contend with a shadow. Fasting is a medicine, but a medicine, though it be never so profitable, becomes frequently useless owing to the unskillfulness of him who employs it. For it is necessary to know, moreover, the time when it should be applied and the requisite quantity of it, and the temperament of body that admits it, and the nature of the country and the season of the year, and the corresponding diet, as well as various other particulars, any of which, if one overlooks, he will mar all the rest that have been named. Now if, when the body needs healing, such exactness is required on our part, much more ought we, when our care is about the soul, and we seek to heal distempers of the mind, to look and to search into every particular with the utmost accuracy. I have said these things, not that we may disparage fasting, but that we may honour fasting. For the honour of fasting consists not in abstinence from food, but in withdrawing from sinful practices, since he who limits his fasting only to an abstinence from meats is one who especially disparages it. Do you fast? Give me proof of it by your works. It is said, by what kind of works? If you see a poor man, take pity on him. If you see an enemy, be reconciled to him. If you see a friend gaining honour, envy him not. If you see a handsome woman, pass her by. For let not the mouth only fast, but also the eye and the ear and the feet and the hands and all the members of our bodies. Let the hands fast by being pure from rapine and avarice. Let the feet fast by ceasing from running to the unlawful spectacles. Let the eyes fast, being taught never to fix themselves rudely upon handsome countenances or to busy themselves with strange beauty. For looking is the food of the eyes, but if this be such as is unlawful or forbidden, it mars the fast and upsets the whole safety of the soul. But if it be lawful and safe, it adorns fasting, for it would be among things the most absurd to abstain from lawful food because of the fast, but with the eyes to touch even what is forbidden. Do you not eat flesh? Feed not upon lasciviousness by means of the eyes. Let the ear fast also, 
The fasting of the ear consists in refusing to receive evil speakings and calumnies. You should not receive a false report, it says. To conclude, here is our friend Steve again, talking about the discipline of fasting. Hey everybody, this is Steve, and are you giving up anything for Lent this year? Sometimes people talk about giving something up for Lent, whether it's pizza or sweets or video games, something we like. But that's not exactly how the church talks about it. First of all, Lent can be really challenging. But thank God, it's not something we do alone. And the church doesn't ask us to give up anything. Instead, the church invites all of us to pray more, to fast more, to serve more, to prepare ourselves as a church to celebrate the resurrection. And when it comes to food, remember, the things we give up hamburgers, hot dogs, whatever it might be, aren't bad. Just like our bodies, food is good. It's a part of God's creation. Normally in the church, we talk about fasting as discipline. For many of us, food is something automatic. We want something, so we eat it. In fact, for many of us, we're so blessed that we can eat anything we want, anytime we want it. During the Christmas fast, we talked about how fasting can help us appreciate the food we have. It does that and more. Fasting invites us to take a step back, to not automatically respond to our cravings. Fasting invites us to think a little bit more about what we eat. Fasting is an exercise of our will and shapes how we make choices. It helps us realize that what we should do and what we want to do aren't always the same thing. We should want to be kind and generous and loving, but let's be honest, we don't always want to be. In the moment, it might feel better to be angry or selfish or worse. The choice to fast is a pretty small one, but it can help us to make bigger choices down the road. We can't run a marathon if we can't run a shorter race, and we can't lift something really heavy if we can't lift something light. Saying no to meat for 40 days might not be the toughest or the most important choice we ever make, but it will help us with more important choices in other situations. Christ helped us to realize this in the parable of the talents. In that parable, a rich man traveled far away from home, and he left his servants with different amounts of money. And when he returned, he asked them what they did with it. The servant that received five talents had ten, and the one that received two now had four. When the Lord saw this, he was happy and said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. The Lord saw that they chose wisely when it came to small responsibilities. So he rewarded them with bigger responsibilities because he saw they were ready. Eating meat or drinking milk isn't a sin, but having the discipline to fast can help us overcome sin in other situations. You see, when we're doing it right, fasting and prayer go hand in hand. When it's the middle of Lent and I'm craving pepperoni pizza, it's a chance for me to take a step back and think about what's important. I can go without pizza for 40 days, but I can't even go a moment without God. When we think through our choices, we think about why we're making those choices. We bring our minds to God. We can pray. Even when fasting is about the food, it's not really about the food. It's about the choices we make. It's about having the discipline to always choose love. It's about having the discipline to always choose God. Here we are at the end of our journey through fasting and preparation for Holy Communion. I hope there's been something for everyone. Thank you for joining me. I hope also that it will help you to begin or continue your journey with God. I look forward to seeing you again next Thursday at 10.30. Remember to like and subscribe and ding that little bell so that you get a reminder of when it's on next. See you on Thursday at 10.30 next week.